I have to report that the order of the day relating to the Prime Minister's motion of condolence in connection with the death of the Hon. Michael William Hodgman has been debated in the Federation Chamber and is returned to the House. I present a certified copy of the motion. I understand it is the wish of the House to consider the matter immediately. The question is that the motion moved by the Hon. Prime Minister be agreed to. As a mark of respect, I ask all present to signify their approval by rising in their places. I thank the House. I have to report that the order of the day relating to the Prime Minister's motion of condolence in connection with the death of Corporal Cameron Stewart Baird, MG, has been debated in the Federation Chamber as returned to the House. I present a certified copy of the motion. I understand it is the wish of the House to consider the matter immediately. The question is that the motion moved by the Honourable the Prime Minister be agreed to. As a mark of respect, I ask all present to signify their approval by rising in their places. I thank the House. The Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. And on indulgence, I remind members of an important anniversary in coming weeks, which deserves mention in this place. Early in 1963, land was excised from the Arnhem Land Reserve to allow bauxite mining on the lands of the Yolngu people. It happened without consultation. It happened without compensation. Fifty years ago, the Yolngu brought their grievance into the home of our great democracy. They crafted two elaborate bark paintings, into the centre of which they pasted typewritten petitions. Beautiful and painstaking as the ochre images are on those sheets of bark, they were not intended as decorative. For the Yolngu, they constituted a legal document, an assertion of their title to the land, rendered in images of deep significance and power. The pasted typewritten sheets bearing the names of the petitioners simply articulated the same claim for land title in a language a parliament 4,000 kilometres away might understand. The presentation of the Yakala Bark petitions to this House and the Senate in August 1963 was the first time an Aboriginal legal document was recognised by an Australian parliament a bridge between two noble legal traditions, the laws of our young Commonwealth and the ancient laws of an ancient people. The Yolngu did not succeed in stopping the mining, but the political and social processes those petitions set in motion led to the Northern Territory Aboriginal Land Rights Act, culminating three decades later in Mabo and, more recently, in the Apology and the historic Gove Agreement that I was privileged to witness being signed two years ago. Today, the Yakala Bark petitions are rightly counted among the founding documents of our nation. So we honour this anniversary and we honour the memory of those proud Australians who came to this parliament in the name of justice. They were right to come. Our nation is more whole and healed because they did. The Leader of the Opposition. Well, uh, Madam Speaker, I uh, support the words of the Prime Minister. <coughs> the uh, Ikala Bark uh, petition was the first uh, traditional Indigenous petition uh, ever to be received uh, in this parliament. Uh, the uh, petition was acknowledged but not actually acted upon, and as the Prime Minister has noted, uh, uh, that which the Yakala uh, and the Yolnu were complaining about uh, went ahead. Uh, nevertheless, it was the beginning of this parliament's consciousness that there were and are in this country Indigenous cultures and Indigenous peoples whose traditions should be respected. Uh, since then, we have seen the 1967 referendum. Um, we have seen uh, land rights legislation, native title legislation, 
uh, the national apology. And who knows, uh, if we are our best selves, uh, uh, we may soon see uh, Indigenous recognition in the Constitution. So, Madam Speaker, uh, this uh, event, which we remember today, was a small step, but it was a first step in a long journey which I hope our nation can soon complete. Here, here. Are there any the Prime Minister doesn't have any no, my apologies. Are there any questions without notice? The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thanks, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister, and I remind her of her planned review of the coverage of the carbon tax in the next term of Parliament. Will the Prime Minister rule out expanding the carbon tax to cover the farm sector or the family car? The Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, I can rule out covering the family car. That is not covered by current pricing, carbon pricing legislation. There is absolutely no proposal or suggestion by the government that it does. Uh, for the farm sector, I think the Leader of the Opposition is well aware that the problem with the farm sector is that there is no reliable way of measuring emissions, and that means that it is not possible for the farm sector to be covered by carbon pricing. However, it is possible for the farm sector to benefit uh, from carbon uh, reduction arrangements. We have ensured that farming does benefit through our carbon farming initiative, uh, and I'd want to uh, pay some tribute to uh, Tony Windsor and Rob Oakeshott on the design of this. It is an important way for farmers to realise additional value from their land by ensuring that their farming practices assist our environment by taking carbon pollution out of the atmosphere and storing it in the soil. And we have made sure that there is a stream of assistance and a stream of funding that can reward our farmers for those best practice endeavours. Of course, all of that uh, is uh, at risk from the Leader of the Opposition's policies and plans. He is right to point out to this parliament uh, that uh, the government being re-elected in September will give the nation stability on carbon pricing. What he ought to do is he should point out very clearly the alternative, which is if he is elected, there will be complete chaos because of the half-baked na na uh, nature of his policies and plans and his plan to throw the Australian economy and the Australian nation into turmoil uh, to try and get rid of a carbon pricing policy which he used to support, which he stood on a platform in 2007 in favour of and which he knows in his heart of hearts is working. The Leader of the Opposition on a supplementary. Yes, and I remind the Prime Minister of a pre-election statement there will be no carbon tax yeah, under the yeah. government I lead. Given that that assurance could not be relied upon, how can people rely upon the assurance that the Prime Minister has just given? Yeah. The Prime Minister has the call. Uh, well, back, you to, back to our old favourite. And of course, because the Leader of the Opposition is unable to win a debate on the facts, he yeah, is yeah. always reduced to this, and it is somewhat embarrassing for him. What I can say to the Leader of the Opposition is uh, the history of carbon pricing in this country. In 2007, Prime Minister Howard indicated to the Australian electorate that he favoured an emissions trading scheme, as did the Leader of the Opposition. Yeah, yeah. And the member for McKellar is is yelling out, and he lost the election. Uh, the the, the climate, uh, climate sceptics, alive and well on the front bench of the opposition, are repudiating the political legacy of John Howard. Quite remarkable. Uh, Prime Minister Howard stood for election wanting to have an emissions trading scheme. The Leader of the Opposition stood at his side wanting to have an emissions trading scheme. This government, since its election, has fought for an emissions trading scheme, and now that emissions trading scheme is the law of this country. So the law of this country is stable, is strong and is working. The threat to that is the Leader of the Opposition's ridiculous plans, completely unable to be explained, uh, to subsidise polluters and to waste money from families doing that, and the Leader of the Opposition's threat to the Australian economy, which all of this chaos and turmoil would cause. And of course, the Leader of the Opposition has expired. The Member for Bass has the call. My question is to the Prime Minister. What progress has there been on the government's plan for better schools 
and what does it mean for Tasmanian schools in particular? Prime Minister has the call. Thank you very much. I was just warming up on carbon pricing, but I do thank the member for Bass for his question uh, because it enables me to draw to the attention of the House something that I think will be treated with delight by this side of the House and by the crossbenchers, which is that the Senate has now passed our Australian Education Bill. It is now the law of this country, a plan for school improvement and a plan for better funding of Australian schools. What the passing of this legislation means is that six out of ten children in Australian schools are now covered by our new funding plans and our plan for school improvement. That's great news for children around the country, in independent schools, in Catholic schools, the children who go to New South Wales schools, the children who go to schools in the ACT, the children who go to schools in South Australia. What they will see from this government is increased resources in their schools, combined with a new way of working which we know lifts outcomes for children. We know it because we've proved it in the national partnership schools where we are already working. Now what remains? is for those Conservative leaders in the other jurisdictions to step forward and to put the children in their schools first. What an absurdity it would be for the Premier of Victoria or the Premier of Queensland to countenance a situation where children in New South Wales had a better resourced education than the children in their schools, where the schools within their jurisdiction were subject to different funding arrangements. We need these premiers to sign up. We need Premier Barnett to sign up. We need the Chief Minister of the Northern Territory to sign up. And so that these vital reforms are not put at risk, we also need the Leader of the Opposition to turn away from his destructive plan, the way in which he is putting pressure on Conservative leaders now to not endorse our plans for school improvement, the way in which he is going to the next election threatening to cut our schools to the bone. Well, our kids deserve better. They deserve a world-class education. Six out of ten Australian children can look forward to that world-class education because of the actions of this Labor government and the laws that have passed the parliament today. I ask the Leader of the Opposition to not put that at risk for Australia's children. The member for North Sydney has the call. My question is to the Treasurer. I remind the Treasurer of the statement of Business Council of Australia President Tony Shepherd that, and I quote, we are now seeing that the economy is not as great as it looked. And the statement of Toll Holdings Chairman Ray Horsburgh that, and I quote, there is a general reluctance to spend money. Will the Treasurer immediately help restore confidence by rescinding the 5 per cent increase of the carbon tax from next Monday? The Treasurer has the call. Well, I do thank the uh, Shadow Treasurer for that Dorothy Dix question, uh, because growth in our economy is solid. Growth of 0.6 for the quarter, 2.5 per cent for the year. A very strong and solid investment pipeline. The creation in the past three years of 500,000 jobs, one million jobs in the time that the government has been in power a surge in investment, all of these things indicate an economy which is in good shape, 14 per cent bigger than it was at the end of 2007, 8 per cent bigger in the last three years alone. Now, of course, there are challenges in our economy, and we are an economy which is in transition. But one of the reasons why we are in a position of strength to handle those transitions is because of what this government did to handle the global financial crisis. And because we handled it so well, we didn't here suffer the very high levels of unemployment and capital destruction that occurred right around the world. But if those opposite would have had their way, would have had their way, this would not have happened. And Australia would have suffered massively high unemployment and capital destruction. The Leader of the Opposition could not even stand up and walk into this parliament to vote 
in the critical vote the that stopped this country from going into recession. Seat. The member for North Sydney on a point of order. I ask the Treasurer, Madam Speaker, will he rescind the 5 per cent increase in the carbon tax, which starts the next Monday? For North Sydney will he do it? Will resume his seat. The Treasurer has the call. Speaker, we on this side of the House are proud of what we have done with an emissions trading scheme and carbon pricing. Absolutely proud. And in the time, in the time that carbon pricing has been operated, 150,000 jobs have been created in Australia. So you can come into this House as you do every day, every week, every month, every year, and talk our economy down. But we on this side of the House will take the decisions for the future the decisions to invest and to make sure that we have a fiscal policy which supports growth and jobs. Because if they were in power when the last budget was brought down, what we would have seen from them is European-style austerity policies. And they would have taken an axe to spending, particularly in health and education. They come into this House every day and say that we're spending too much, but they won't say where they're going to cut to the bone if they're elected and they hide behind a commission of audit, the formula of Premier Newman in Queensland. That won't wash with the Australian people. We on this side of the House will always support jobs and growth because we understand how important jobs are to the livelihood and living standards of all Australians. When the acid was on, where were those opposite? They went missing and the Leader of the Opposition missed five votes in this House treasurer, on the critical the votes which saved our economy from question. recession. They are simply unfit for high office. The member for McEwen has the call. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. How has the government put working people first to secure the strength of the Australian economy? And how will the government's plans support working people into the future? The Treasurer has the call. I do thank the member for McEwen uh, for that question because this government will always put hard-working Australians and their living standards first. And that's what we did back in 2009, when those critical votes were taking place in this parliament on the 13th and 14th of March of that year, when the Leader of the Opposition couldn't come into the House and support or oppose critical bills which saved our country from recession. He couldn't do it. He couldn't stand up and walk into this House and even have the courage of his convictions to vote against those bills. But the Liberal Party voted against those bills. If they would have had their way, we would have experienced a recession, and we wouldn't be in the position of strength that we are in now. So everyone on this side of the House is proud of what we did, because we had the courage of our convictions to support jobs and growth. But we also understand that we have to make sure we put in place the investments for the future. And that's what we did in our recent budget. We fully funded our education reforms, the bills which have just gone through the Senate today. Everybody over here is proud of those bills because they go to the heart of extending our economic capacity, investing in our people for the decades ahead, meeting the challenge of the Asian century by lifting the standards of education of all of our children. But we also understand that what we need to do is to lift our national savings. And that's why we're increasing the superannuation guarantee from 9 to 12 per cent, because we support dignity in retirement, adequate living standards for people who retire, but we also understand that national savings are critical to our economic future, because during the global financial crisis, it was our national savings superannuation pool that assisted all of our businesses to get through that crisis. But we need to build it up again. Half a trillion dollars will be added to that superannuation pool by the investments that we are making and the people of Australia are making in superannuation. But like with education, superannuation is opposed by those opposite. This is what the opposition leader said just last year about superannuation. Well, we strongly oppose the superannuation increase. We have always, as a coalition, been against compulsory superannuation increases. Well, what that means to a 30-year-old on average wages, if they knock off the increases in the superannuation guarantee, is $127,000 at retirement. So these are big differences, big differences in the investments and reforms we have to make to grow our economy, to give people security, to lift their living standards. But on every one of these, we're opposed by those opposite. 
We understand the importance of jobs and growth. We understand the importance of living standards. Those opposites simply want to wreck them. Just before I call the member for Indi, I want to recognise in the gallery today a delegation from the Republic of Belarus, led by the Deputy Minister for Foreign Affairs. We welcome them to the chamber today. The member for Indi has the call. My question is to the Prime Minister. I remind Pri the Prime Minister that in this White House statement on climate change, there's no mention of any plans for the US to impose an economy-wide pricing scheme, but instead the US is taking a direct action approach like the coalition's policy. Why won't the Prime Minister finally admit that her carbon tax is pushing up electricity prices, decreasing investment and damaging trade-exposed industries, costing jobs, and rescind the increase in the carbon tax next Monday? The Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thank you very much. Well, I'm used to the opposition coming in and misrepresenting circumstances around the world. Now, of course, they're prepared to come in here and misrepresent policy statements by President Obama. Uh, so quite a remarkable thing that the opposition would come into this parliament and do that, misrepresent a statement by President Obama. No one who has followed this debate could possibly come to the conclusion that the member for Indi has come to, that the statement by the President of the United States in any way endorses or backs in the subsidies for polluters approach that the opposition has endorsed. President Obama is not talking about that. President Obama, of course, with the uh, Congress that he works with, has to take a regulatory approach. There is no secret that the American Congress tried to find a consensus around carbon pricing and because of the hyper-partisanship there, which has infected uh, the opposition yeah, yeah. here, getting their tactics as they do from the Tea Party, uh, that the American administration was not able to find that consensus in Congress. So President Obama has decided to take a regulatory approach about emissions intensity from things like power stations, not in any way an endorsement or comparable to the opposition's subsidy for polluters plan. But what is remarkable here is that the opposition now comes into this parliament day after day and puts questions to me saying, why isn't Australia's carbon pricing scheme more like someone else's in another part of the world? I've taken questions about the scheme in New Zealand, for example. Now, what this is is a complete reversal of a major section of the opposition's fear campaign, because they used to wander around the country. They used to come into this parliament saying no one in any part of the world was acting. We were the only people acting. How foolhardy was it for Australia to go it alone, they used to say. Uh, that was uh, all of the opposition's, or at least a very strong part, of their fear campaign. Now they come into this parliament instead and say, can we have a scheme like someone else's? Well, you can't pursue both lines of argument. Yes, we are. We are tackling carbon pollution. Yes, the rest of the world is tackling carbon pollution. Yes, the political party getting left behind by the tide of human history is the Liberal Party. You used to be better than this under Prime Minister Howard when you believed in rational economic principles and an emissions trading scheme. Now, of course, under this leader of the opposition for a bit of cheap politics, you've turned your back on that and you should be ashamed of it. The member for Indi is seeking a supplementary to table the document. I leave uh, to table the document and ask the Prime Minister to identify where in this document the there's a carbon Indi tax or an ETF. will resume her seat. Is leave granted to table the document? Uh, no, no, it isn't. But, uh, Speaker, I'd like to table a document. I'd like to table a copy of President uh, Barack Obama's remarks on climate change. Uh, and I would uh, draw the Parliament's attention to the statement in my State of the Union address, I urge Congress to come up with a bipartisan market-based solution to climate change, like the one that Republican and Democratic senators worked on together a few years ago. And I, President Obama, still want to see that happen. I'm willing to work with anyone to make that happen. Stop verbaling President Obama. You've got to draw the line at something. The member for Dobell has the call. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. 
Prime Minister, as you know, I secured $20 million in government funding to clean up Tugra Lakes. Are you willing Order. to commit further funding to ensure that the lakes are clean and this wonderful natural asset of ours continues to have the necessary environmental work done to continue the long-term job of rehabilitating Tugra Lakes? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you very much, and I thank the member for Dobell for his question. And I acknowledge that he has pursued this issue for a long period of time for his community, and that he is very concerned about water quality in his local lakes, in Tuggera Lakes. And I can also confirm, as the uh, member has uh, said in his question, that we did, as part of our 2007 election commitments, uh, indicate that we would provide $20 million to improve water quality management. That was done, and that project is currently being delivered by the Wyong Shire Council. Uh, it's being done in two stages. Uh, stage one of this project uh, has been uh, committed and I think probably completed, and stage two is on track for completion in 2013. I do understand that the uh, member and his local council uh, want to see more work done on water quality in these lakes. I understand how deep uh, this runs in his community because I know uh, that of the work done so far, close to 1,300 volunteers have been uh, involved in, in this work and in like works around the country. So uh, that is a huge number of people who care very deeply about water quality. Uh, what I can also say to the member is I am aware that Wyong Shire Council has applied for funding under the competitive rounds, uh, grant rounds from the Caring for Our Country program. Uh, all applications submitted in that competitive grants round are assessed. Uh, under the guidelines, they need to uh, meet the criteria of eligibility and merit. That is a process that needs to be seen through and seen through properly. So I can assure him that the application from his local community is in that process and will be properly considered. I know that he will continue as local member to argue the merits of this proposal, which is of course appropriate. The member for Deakin has the call. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. What progress has there been on the government's plan for better schools, Prime Minister, and what does this mean for schools in my state of Victoria? The Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thank you very much, and I thank the member for Deakin for his question. And I know that he, along with other Victorian members, have followed with some sense of concern uh, the engagement between the federal government and the Victorian government, because they know that they can now look across the New South Wales border or look, look across the border into South Australia and see schools that are going to benefit from our new funding and our plans for school improvement. And they have worried that the children in their local schools will be left behind. I am therefore very pleased to be able to say to the member for Deakin and the House uh, that the Premier of Victoria has just written to me to outline a position on school funding. I welcome his letter and his readiness to engage in this negotiation. It's not before time. But it shows that he recognises that school funding reform and school improvement cannot be ignored. The Australian Education Act, as I advised the parliament a little bit earlier in question time, is now law. It delivers an entitlement to excellent school funding that every student in Australia should be able to benefit from. I can confirm to the House that I am willing to negotiate with the Victorian Premier in good faith to deliver an outcome for Victorian schools. Of course, the terms of the arrangement will be the same as the ones we have signed with New South Wales, South Australia and the ACT. The Victorian Premier needs to show that he is making a basic commitment to doing his part in investing in Victorian schools. The offer I've made is a good one, a basically two-for-one funding deal between the federal government and the state government for Victoria. I can confirm that the legislation we have passed provides for the empowerment of school communities and principals and the flexibility and diversity of schools and school systems, including in Victoria. So I very much welcome the step forward taken by the Premier of Victoria today. I look forward to working with him in good faith to make sure that Victorian students are not left behind and that our nation is offering them a world-class education as their birthright. The member for Dunkley has the call. 
Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Treasurer. I remind the Treasurer of the statement of his own parliamentary secretary on Monday when he said, and I quote, small business doesn't pay the carbon price. Does the Treasurer agree with his parliamentary secretary? And if so, will he be issuing refunds to the over 2 million Australian small businesses for the average 10 per cent increase in retail electricity prices they have paid this year as a result of Labor's carbon tax? The Treasurer has the call. Yes, I do. Uh, I do thank the member for his question because it gives me the opportunity to talk about a range of policies impacting upon small business and, in particular, our whole budget strategy, which supports jobs and growth and keeps the doors of small business open. Because if this country were faced with the sort of austerity policies put forward by the Shadow Minister for Finance over there and the Shadow Treasurer, the doors of small businesses would be closing right around the country. And of course, as everybody here knows, that was something they were particularly indifferent to at the end of February 2009 when they voted against a whole range of measures to support demand and to support small businesses in our community. We are particularly proud of what we have done in this area and, most particularly, we are proud of the initiative we have put in place through the instant asset write-off, $6,500 instant asset write-off for millions of small businesses right around our country. I would urge everybody, I'd urge everybody who is in small business— seat. The member for Dunkley on a point of order. Uh, thanks, Speaker. We're not talking about the budget that predicts lower growth and higher the unemployment. This was about the carbon tax and whether you'll issue a refund, because apparently the small business hasn't been paying. The member for his seat. I will not continue to tolerate abuses of points of order. The Treasurer has the call. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I know the member is indifferent to the instant asset write-off, worth over a billion dollars over a billion dollars to small businesses, a major boost to their cash flow. Certainly it's understood by small business organisations if it's not understood by the shadow minister over there. I was also asked about the impact of the carbon price, and the shadow minister knows full well it is paid by the largest companies in the country. And they want to go around as part of their fear, fear campaign and argue that somehow it's imposed directly on a whole host of businesses. He knows that's not true. It's simply part of their continuous fear-mongering to obscure the fact that if they were in charge in this country, they'd take the axe to spending, they'd send unemployment through the roof. That would lead to business closures. That's the sort of austerity plan they've got for Australia, which they're trying to hide behind a commission of audit. Well, there's been an experiment in this, in this country in recent times. It's from Premier Newman in Queensland, and it's produced the worst economic results of any state in the country. Yeah. The member for Throsby has the call. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Climate Change, Industry and Innovation. Will the minister update the House on international action to tackle dangerous climate change? And how does this compare with predictions? The Minister for Climate Change, Innovation and Industry has the call. Thank you very much, Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for Throsby for his question, because too often we hear these issues about climate change and action being taken in other countries misrepresented. And we've heard it just a, just a moment ago from the member for Indi, misrepresenting President Obama's speech last night outlining a plan to take action on climate change in the United States. And of course, the opposition leader's a serial offender in this regard constantly misrepresenting the action that is taken by our major trading partners on the issue of climate change. All pure deceit and mendacity, time and time again. We know that carbon pricing started last week in Shenzhen in China, and it will shortly commence in a number of other cities and provinces throughout China. And overnight, of course, President Obama announced a comprehensive plan to tackle climate change in the US. And he did emphasise, as the Prime Minister brought to the attention of the House a moment ago, his preference for a market-based mechanism to deal with this issue. But Republicans, of course, in the US Congress, like the Liberal Party here, have been captured by extremists, captured by extremists who block rational economic policy making and deny facts and deny the climate science. That's what we're dealing with that side of the House. That's what President Obama is dealing with in the US co excuse me, Congress. Now, President Obama's plan includes measures to reduce emissions from coal-fired power generation, to support renewable energy, to promote energy efficiency, 
and to promote investment in clean energy innovation. It builds on the emissions trading scheme arrangements that already exist in a number of US states, including the state of California, which has an emissions trading scheme in place. And President Obama made absolutely clear <coughs> and unequivocal his respect for the climate science and also said this, had this to say, I don't have much patience for anyone who denies that this challenge is real. We don't have time for a meeting of the Flat Earth Society. And, Speaker, the convener of the Flat Earth Society in Australia sits over there. The opposition leader describes the science as absolute crap. I mean, what a disreputable position for a political leader in this country to deny facts and science. He went around the country with his mendacious campaign. Wyala wiped off the map. Prices going through the roof. Wouldn't be able to afford anything. The cost of living is going to destroy the economy. Hundreds of thousands of jobs were going to go. The US is doing nothing. China's doing nothing. Why on earth would Australia be doing anything at all? As the deception has gone up and up and up, the emissions are coming down and down and down. We've made a great Labor reform, and your position is a moral disgrace. The minister's time has expired. Before I call the next member, before I call, oh, there we are. Well done. Before I actually call the next member, I'm glad he got the hint. I inform the House we're present in the gallery this afternoon. Members of a delegation from the Socialist Republic of Vietnam, who are visiting Australia under the auspices of the Australian Political Exchange Council. On behalf of the House, I extend a very warm welcome to the members. The member for Bradfield has the call. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. I remind the Prime Minister that when the carbon tax was introduced, Treasury assumed that a coordinated international regime would ensure a harmonised world carbon price by 2016. Given not one of China, the US, India, Russia and Japan have enforceable abatement commitments in place, and it is now clear that the carbon tax was introduced based on a false assumption, why won't the Prime Minister rescind the increase in the carbon tax next Monday? The Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thank you very much, and I thank the uh, member for his question. And I'm uh, I'm, I'm very interested in the nature of the opposition's questions today because are we scrambling around again now that the fear campaign is running out of any factual content? Uh, they used to come into this parliament and say no one in the world was acting. Now they come into this parliament and use examples of nations that are acting. They used to come into this parliament and complain about the whole of carbon pricing. Now they seem to be narrowing their opposition down to scheduled increases in carbon pricing. Right. It's a little bit interesting, isn't it? Exactly. It's a little bit interesting. I wonder where that's going to lead to exactly. under the opposition. I genuinely do. Uh, because let me assure you, there are many Australians who listen to the Leader of the Opposition on carbon pricing and his uh, plans to say that he will repeal carbon pricing, and they look at him and they wonder about his intentions. Well, they should watch the Prime this Minister question time today. Yeah. See, the member for Bradfield on a point of order. The point of order is relevant, Madam Speaker. The assumption was harmonised world carbon price by 2016. Uh, Where is Bradfield it? Bradfield will resume his seat. The Prime Minister has the call and is being relevant to the question. Uh, thank you very much. And so the uh, opposition obviously in a state of movement about what it thinks about carbon pricing. Uh, but against that, let me say to the member, uh, the uh, same Treasury people, the people of the same professionalism who advised the Howard government that an emissions trading scheme was the best way and least cost way of reducing carbon pollution. Those same people have advised this government of that fact. So it is a fact that carbon pricing is the best way and least cost way of reducing carbon pollution. Uh, John Howard knew that. The Leader of the Opposition knew that when he was on the government benches. The Leader of the Opposition has said that, even when he's been opposition leader, and people know it around the world. Uh, now to the member's question. Because the rest of the world is addressing carbon pollution, we as a nation must act too, and we are acting. And as we act, we act in the least cost way. That's the responsible thing to do. Why would you want our nation to pay more than it needs to to reduce carbon pollution? Prime Minister John Howard didn't want to do that. He wanted the least cost approach. 
Well, we have taken the least cost approach. The problem for the member uh, is he is handcuffed to a policy of subsidising polluters, which increases the costs to our nation of addressing carbon pollution. So really what he is asking is that every family and every business in his community says yes to the nation paying more to reduce carbon pollution than it needs to. It's an absurdity, a policy absurdity, a mendacious claim that has led to a policy absurdity. We on this side of the parliament stand for the stability and certainty which comes from pursuing carbon pricing as legislated into Australian law because it's working. Yeah, yeah. The member for Page has the call. My question is to the Minister for School Education, Early Childhood and Youth. Minister, will you please update the House on the legislation to implement the National Plan for School Improvement, and what will this mean for students in schools across Australia? The Minister for School Education, Early Childhood and Youth. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I thank the member for Page for her question. Uh, this government is about making sure that we do things which will make a difference to Australia, bringing in big reforms that will improve our country now and for the future, whether it's a price on carbon, the national broadband network, a national disability insurance scheme. And today, the parliament has also passed the Australian Education Bill to put in place for the first time ever a needs-based funding system to support school education in our nation. And this is a very big, very important day in the history of education in Australia, and it's a proud day for this government to see this reform now in law. And I want to place on record my appreciation of all the work that has been done by officials here and officials at the state level, the education sector itself. And I know on this side of the House we've always understood how important it is to provide additional investment in school education to kids anywhere in the country, no matter where they are living and no matter how much money their parents earn. So for the first time, we have a needs-based funding system. For the first time, we want to provide additional investment across the support for education on the things that can make a difference in a school. And I'm asked by the member, what will this mean for students? Well, the fact is, it will mean focused, targeted support in things like literacy in the early years of primary school. It will mean that kids that need special support, if they have a special need or a disability, will get it and will get it in a way that makes a difference to their learning. It means that principals will have more autonomy uh, in the school, making decisions over what happens. It means we'll have better training for teachers, the most important person in the classroom when the kids come to school. And it means that we've got a national plan for school improvement agreed by states and non-government school systems that's focused on getting us back into the top five of performing nations in education by 2025. This government does not want to see a single child left behind. And the only way that we can do that is by making sure that we invest in education in a way that is targeted and focused on the things that make a difference. Now, they've crawled into a small ball on the other side of the house, but when I'm asked what this means for students, it's now important. It's now important for the premiers of states that have not yet signed up. The Premier of Victoria, the door is now open. That's welcome news. The Premier of Queensland, with some $3.8 billion of additional investment ready. The Premier of Western Australia and, of course, the Chief Minister of the Northern Territory. At the end of the day, this government and this party understands that a fair funding system means that every young Australian can reach their full potential and contribute to the great nation that it's ours and the great challenges that we have in the future. Yeah. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition has yeah. the call. Yeah. My question is to the Prime Minister. Does the Prime Minister agree with her Minister for Foreign Affairs, who stated yesterday that the surge in asylum seeker arrivals generated by people smugglers was, and I quote, overwhelmingly not people fleeing persecution, but economic migrants, and was intruding on Australia's humanitarian program? If so, why is the government granting protection visas to nine out of ten people who arrive by boat illegally? The Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, to the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, thank you for her question because it enables me uh, to explain some of the approach that the government takes here. 
Uh, there are, of course, various stages of assessment of asylum seeker claims, and when people present and raise no reasonable prospect uh, that they have a protection claim, when it is clear uh, that they are seeking, uh, to use the terminology, economic migrants, that is, that they have come here for economic reasons, uh, then we do endeavour to promptly return people. And, for example, with uh, Sri Lankan, uh, the outflow from Sri Lanka, we are very promptly returning people. Indeed, we've returned, I believe, it's more than 1,000 people uh, because they have been screened out of any assessment process because they are economic migrants. Uh, then, of course, there are some people that raise a credible claim uh, that they may be able to engage Australia's protection obligations. Now, I still understand it to be bipartisan policy that we should be signatories to the Refugee Convention. And if people do raise a credible claim, then that claim is appropriately assessed. Uh, that is, it is assessed in the same way that claims uh, have been assessed in this country for some period of time. Uh, this is not just uh, the poli policies of one side of politics. Uh, that is, that it is assessed by the department, and then there are various review levels, including the Refugee Review Tribunal. Uh, and I'd remind the uh, member opposite who asked the question that when she sat on the government benches, uh, that also used to occur. And so, uh, out of those processes, yes, there is screening. Uh, so, if people are economic migrants and not engaging our protection obligations, we move promptly to return them. Uh, so, it does pay in this debate to deal with the facts. It does pay to deal with the complexity, and it does pay to properly ground your policies based on an understanding of both. That's what we do, advised by experts through the Houston panel. Of course, that's not what the opposition does, because they would prefer to stay with their negativity and their simplistic slogans yeah. and come into the parliament and vote for more votes. The member for Robertson has the call. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Families, Community Services, Indigenous Affairs and Disability Reform. Will the minister update the House on how the government is delivering fairer support to help families with school costs? How is the government making sure families can access this support? And what would be the impact if it was taken away? The Minister for Families, Communities, Indigenous Affairs and Disability Reform has the call. Thank you, Speaker, very much. And I do thank the member for Robertson for her question and uh, more particularly for the wonderful work that she does uh, up there on the Central Coast, uh, really standing up for the needs of families, uh, especially all those young families who live in her electorate. Well, Australian families do face a very, very clear choice in the coming election. A clear choice between a Labor government that wants to deliver the support that families need and those opposite, a Liberal Party that will cut to the bone. Yeah. Labor, of course, delivered the school kids bonus. Yeah. The school kids bonus uh, that, of course, is delivering much needed support to families. And uh, next week, from next week, families will start to get the second uh, school kids yeah, yeah, bonus. Yeah. The second school kids bonus yeah, yeah. will be paid into families' bank accounts. 1.3 million families uh, will yeah, receive yeah. this extra yeah, money yeah, in their dollars. bank accounts. For uh, those families with a teenager, a child in secondary school, they'll receive uh, $410 and for a child in primary school, $205. So this is much needed assistance for families to help with the costs of school uniforms, to help with the winter sports gear, to make sure that families uh, get that extra help with school books as children go into term three. Well, we do know, uh, Speaker, that those opposite have one plan. They mightn't have many plans, but they do have one plan. They have one plan to abolish the school kids bonus, to claw back all of this money, all of this money. They just think it's a joke. They think it's a joke that this, this opposition would take $15,000 $15, out of the pockets of an ordinary family over the school life of their children. That's what those opposite want to take. 
And, uh, of course, while we're talking to families about the benefits that we're delivering to them, those opposite, uh, I can inform uh, the House, uh, don't mind getting some of the family kits from uh, the government. Oh, no. They're out there, the member for Hume, the member for Hughes, the member for Boothby, Riverina, Calair, Gray, even the whip over there, the member for Leichhardt. They're ordering the families' kits from the government, oh. telling everyone that they like the school kids' bonus and how great it is, even though they voted against it and they're going to abolish it. Get honest with the Australian people. The Leader of the Opposition has the call. Yes, Madam Speaker, I have a question to the Prime Minister. Given the paralysis now gripping her government and the irreconcilable differences in her party over its leadership, Will she bring forward the election date to August the 3rd and let the people decide who should run our country? The Prime Minister has the call. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. And to the uh, Leader of the Opposition's question, uh, it's a pity that he didn't lis listen to some of the answers earlier in question time because I can assure him and I can assure the Australian people that as Prime Minister I am getting on with the job and that is what the government is doing. That's why I can come into this parliament today and say that through this parliament we have legislated to improve school funding, to invest in our nation's future, to enable every child to realise their full potential, a system that now applies to six out of ten children and historic Labor reform, 40 years since school funding was properly looked at. We have worked on this patiently over five years, and today it has gone through the parliament. And yes, of course, we need to strike more agreements with state premiers, and that's why we are continuing discussions. And I was able to report to the parliament today that the Premier of Victoria has opened the door to those good faith discussions. And let me assure the parliament we will be walking through that door. At the same time, we are continuing to make sure our economy grows and offers people jobs and opportunity. We are delivering our Jobs Act through the parliament and we are delivering our plans to create jobs today and to invest in the sources of growth tomorrow. The National Broadband Network, a clean energy future, innovation, innovation precincts so that we move from the stages of inventing new knowledge to using that new knowledge to create jobs and opportunity for the Australian people more quickly. We are continuing to chart our nation's course in the Asian century, including me personally committing myself to an annual leaders' dialogue with the President of Indonesia in coming days, because we know our future is in this region and we know that that offers our nation an historic opportunity to engage in this century of growth. So, whilst the Leader of the Opposition continues with his negativity, continues to hide his plan for cuts, continues to be out there with slogans rather than solutions to complex problems, we are getting on with the job of building a stronger and smarter and fairer Australia. Yeah. And yes, in September, people will have the opportunity to judge. They will have the opportunity to judge who has the best plan for investment in our nation's future and who has a plan to cut to the bone and to bring our nation's economy to a standstill by cutting too hard and cutting in the wrong places. The Australian people will make that choice and I certainly believe the Australian people will vote for a stronger, smarter and fairer future under a Labor government. Yeah. The Leader of the Opposition is seeking the call. Yes, Madam Speaker. Uh, I uh, move that so much of the standing and sessional orders be suspended as would prevent the Leader of the Opposition from moving the following motion. That this House calls on the government to end its uh, internal arguments and actually to get on with governing this country. Yeah. And if it can't, to restore the selection of the Prime Minister to the people in an election where it should be. Uh, Madam Speaker, I move this way. I move this way. Standing orders must be suspended because right now in this building 
No one is interested in the proceedings of this parliament. Everyone is interested in the conversations that are taking place in corridors. Everyone is interested uh, in the plotting that is going on inside offices. And what that's all about, Madam Speaker, is yet another deal inside the Labor Party, yet another deal between the faceless men to try to work out which particular leader is going to give them the best chance of winning the election. Well, I say, Madam Speaker, the public are sick of the deals behind closed doors. The public are sick of the incompetence. They're sick of the deception. What they want is their chance to determine the future of the country. What they want is their chance to vote for a government and to decide who should be the Prime Minister of this country. And they deserve it. And they deserve it sooner than it will happen <laughs> under the current Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, the poison inside the Australian Labor Party is paralysing government in this country. And every hour, every day, that this is not resolved, the paralysis inside the government just gets worse and worse. That's why standing orders should be suspended. What we saw today uh, were the resignations, uh, or at least the indications, uh, 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 that the strongest supporters uh, of this Prime Minister, the members for Line and the members for New England, uh, are not going to contest uh, the election. Uh, we see uh, the tremors the tremors of leadership change shaking the foundations of this parliament. Well, I say let's debate it honestly in this chamber. Uh, let the Prime Minister say honestly uh, why she should uh, retain the job. Let the member for Griffiths say honestly uh, why he should be given the job. But above all else, let the Australian people have their chance to decide who should be the Prime Minister of this country, and let that chance come as soon as possible. We deserve so much better than this, Madam Speaker. We deserve so much better than this. I say to the Australian people, do not think that what you have seen over the last three years is the best that this parliament can do. We can do so much better for you than this Prime Minister and this government has done for you, and we will do it if we are given the chance at the forthcoming election. Let's bring on the election and let's put the future of this country in the hands of the people rather than allowing it to continue to be traded by the faceless men in their ceaseless quest to come up with a less unpopular Prime Minister than the one we currently have. Madam Speaker, standing orders must be suspended because this is the only question that is really consuming the members of this parliament right now. It's the only question that can plausibly and credibly be for the parliament right now. How can we get a better government? How can we resolve the problems facing our country? And the only way to get a better government is to have an election. And the only way to resolve the problems facing this country is to get a better government, and the only way we can do that is with an election. Madam Speaker, it gives me no joy to say in the course of this motion of suspension of standing orders that we all wished the Prime Minister well uh, when she came uh, into office on 24 June uh, 2010. I was conscious, very conscious as the father of three daughters, of just what a milestone in our national life had been achieved. I was conscious of the significance of the occasion, and while I deeply regretted, while I deeply regretted the sustained plotting and treachery that had resulted in the change of leadership, nevertheless, I thought that it was an opportunity for our country to make a new beginning. A bad government, she said, had, a good government, she said, uh, had lost its way. But what we now know from subsequent statements by this Prime Minister that even she knew that it was a bad government. It wasn't a good government uh, that had lost its way. It was a bad government, paralysed by chaos and dysfunction uh, because uh, the member for Griffiths was incapable of adequately leading it. But the trouble, Madam Speaker, and this is why 
the standing orders should be suspended. The trouble is that every single problem has just got worse in the three years since the 24th of June. She said she was going to fix the climate change issue. Well, what did we get? We got the pre-election declaration there would be no carbon tax under the government I lead and the post-election decision to have a carbon tax. So the Prime Minister's leadership was paralysed from the outset by two acts of deception, two acts of treachery. That's why, that's why standing orders should be suspended. First of all, there was the betrayal of the member for Griffiths, the former Prime Minister. Then there was the betrayal of the Australian people uh, through uh, the carbon tax that was never going to happen. But the betrayal went on. There was the betrayal of the member for Denison, Mr Wilkie, uh, who was going to get poker machine reform, but he didn't. There was a betrayal of the member for Scullin, the former speaker, uh, whose speakership was terminated because it suited the political convenience of the Prime Minister to do so. There has been the sheer incompetence uh, of a government and a Prime Minister which cannot get its spending under control, which is why standing orders should be suspended. Uh, there was the mining tax that was going to raise uh, $30-odd billion, uh, but instead has raised a tiny, tiny fraction, some 5 per cent uh, of the promised revenue. Uh, that's why standing orders should be suspended. And then, Madam, Deputy, Madam Speaker, there is the disaster on our borders. The disaster on our borders. And whether uh, the member for Lawler uh, or the member for Griffith uh, is the Prime Minister of this country and is leading the Labor Party for the time being, neither of them have a clue how to resolve the disaster on our borders. That's why standing orders should be suspended, because the only way to resolve the disaster on our borders is to put in place a strong government led by ministers who know what they are doing. Madam Speaker, this is such a great country. We are such a proud people. We have such a great future. But it is time the people of Australia were allowed to choose their government. It is time the people of Australia were allowed to choose their Prime Minister. We have seen three years of minority government we have seen enough, Madam Speaker. Yeah, yeah. We know it doesn't work. And why should we limp on for another 80 days of confusion and paralysis uh, under the current regime? And, Madam Speaker, one of the things that the Australian people find so humiliating uh, at this time is that they know their future is at least as much in the hands of unelected union leaders as it is in the hands of elected members of parliament. And don't we know, Madam Speaker, and this is why standing orders should be suspended, don't we know that in the end all of this for the last three years has been about the unions? The AWU boss went on late line on that famous night to say that the Prime Minister's polling had collapsed, uh, therefore he should be replaced. Now, of course, uh, the same gentleman goes on late line, and this is why standing orders should be suspended, to say, sure, uh, the Prime Minister's polling has collapsed, but above all else, we must keep the current Prime Minister. It's all about the unions. Right. Well, I say, forget the unions. Let's think about the people. Let's think about the people. Let's give the people the say in who should be their Prime Minister and who should be their government. I say, what we should have in this country is democracy of the people, by the people, for the people, not of the people, by the unions, for the unions. Let's support this motion. Let's have an election. Is the motion seconded? The member for Sturt. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I do second the motion. And can I say that I do so much more in sorrow than I do in anger? Because I do feel sorry for my country. I feel sorry that this country has had to put up with a government that has become such a shambles, such a dysfunctional embarrassment that has made us the laughing stock of our region and in some quarters in the world. I am sorry that our Prime Minister and our government has, so, has such contempt for the Australian people 
that they have so internally focused all their attention that standing orders need to be suspended today because it is more important to air the issues surrounding the Labor Party leadership again than it is to do any other item of business because the parliament, the media and the public are paralysed by the ongoing train wreck that this government and this country has become. So I am sorry for the Australian people. I'm sorry for them that they've had to put up for three years with the division and the dysfunction and the chaos and the bitterness and the poison that is the hallmark of this terrible, shambolic, embarrassing government. I'm sorry, Madam Speaker, that we've had to move this motion today because what we're seeing at the moment in Australia is a Prime Minister that has gone from being the hunter to the hunted, that started as Lady Macbeth three years ago and that this week we see her in the role of Madame Defarge, who thought she was going to an execution and it turned out to be her own. Today or tomorrow, the Labor Party appears to be moving against the Prime Minister. Yet again, three years later, almost to the day, the faceless men of the ALP, in their desperate attempt to scramble onto any floating boat, any floating device, believe that if they execute the Prime Minister politically, they may save themselves and their little bit of power that they have in the Labor caucus. But what are they changing to, Madam Speaker, if they do indeed change? What have they said about this apparent white knight riding over the hills to save the Labor Party, one of the worst governments in Australia's history? Who could serve from the front bench under a government that is headed by the member for Griffith? A, list, a litany of ministers have said they would not serve, Madam Speaker. The Treasurer, the Minister for Communications, the Minister for Schools, the Minister for Early Childhood, the Minister for Trade, the Minister for Health, the Minister for Resources. Seven ministers, most of them cabinet ministers, would immediately be forced to resign if the Labor Party returns to the member for Griffith. A worse day of knives than the one that followed the Prime Minister seeing off the putative challenge in March this year. And what if the member for Griffith becomes the Prime Minister again? How could he lead a party that has refused to be led by him before? The Treasurer said about the member for Griffith, the party was given, has given the member for Griffith all the opportunities in the world, and he wasted them with his dysfunctional decision-making, his deeply demeaning attitude towards other people, including his caucus colleagues. He also said he sought to tear down the 2010 campaign, deliberately risking an Abbott prime ministership and now he undermines the government at every turn. The Treasurer said the truth is that Prime Minister Rudd is deeply flawed. Steve Gibbons, the retiring member of Bendigo, said only a psychopath with a giant ego would line up again after being comprehensively rejected by the overwhelming majority of his colleagues. The Minister for Water said, and the stories that were around of the chaos, of the temperament, of the inability to make decisions, they are not stories. And Stephen the Conroy member, said the member for Griffith the chair has needs to refer well, to the standing motion orders need to be suspended, Madam chair. Speaker, so that we can air the conversations publicly that are happening in the corridors of the Parliament as we speak. Cor conversations like this one, where the member for Minister for Communications said Kevin Rudd had contempt for the cabinet, contempt for the cabinet members, contempt for the caucus contempt for the parliament, and the Australian people worked out he had contempt for them. Madam Speaker, standing orders should be suspended because the country deserves so much better than we are seeing from this government. And only a proper debate that airs all the grievances that the Labor Party has with the member for Griffith can clear the air this afternoon and allow an election to be held on August the 3rd to give the people the chance to decide, not the faceless men. The question is, the motion be agreed to? I call the Leader of the House. Thank you, Speaker. I rise for the 81st time in this <laughs> parliament to oppose a suspension of standing orders moved by those opposite. What we have seen, seen from those opposite in recent times is an attempt by this bloke to remake himself. That's right. Human Tony. Yeah, 
human, Tony, standing up, moving a suspension, right. allegedly more in regret, more in sorrow than anger. Angry Tony's been put aside. That Mark Member Riley moment for members by we haven't seen title. for some time. And what we shouldn't do is indulge this Leader of the Opposition. That's why we shouldn't suspend standing orders. What we did hear from the Leader of the Opposition was the complete absence of a single policy idea. Here we are, the second last sitting day of this term, and not a single policy idea from the Leader of the Opposition or the Manager of Opposition Business. Well, I'll tell you what. Over coming months, up until September, they will not be able to get away with having no education policy, with no, having no health policy, with having no detail policy whatsoever. We on this side of the House have a plan for the future of the nation, and they exposed themselves early on when the Leader of the Opposition stood up at the beginning of this debate and he said, no one's interested in the parliament. No one's interested in the parliament. He's right that he is not interested in the parliament, but that does not excuse his projection. What we have had in this parliament today, today is the Australian Education Bills passed the parliament, a significant reform about the future of our young people. Earlier today, just prior to question time, we had the first stages passed, the second reading, of the 457 legislation, important legislation saying simply this, saying simply this, that before a 457 is applied, we should advertise and see if Australian workers are available first. One would have thought, one would have thought, not a radical proposition, but of course opposed by those opposite. The fact is we have engaged for three years in having to put up with the longest dummy spit in Australian political history. Because, because they don't see it's not that they don't see this government as being legitimate because it's Labor. They don't see any Labor government as being legitimate. They are born to rule these Tories opposite. Born to rule, they believe they have a right to the government benches, which is why they failed so dismally during the 17 days of negotiations with the cross bench. Those opposite also said, we know it doesn't work. Really? 590 pieces of legislation, important reform, putting a price on carbon, the Australian education bills, disability reform, in the area of the environment, the largest ever marine parks in the world, the Tasmanian forestry reforms, aged care legislation. Right across the whole spectrum, we have seen reform pass this House because we have been prepared to engage in the serious policy debates. The future is not assured. It can't be taken for granted. That's why you've got to do the hard work. And we on this side of the House do have a philosophical difference with those on the opposite. We believe that government has the ability to empower people and opportunity. We believe that government can play a positive role in people's lives. Those opposite think if government just get out of the way and leave it to market forces, it will all be OK. There is a fundamental difference. However, the carbon, the carbon sceptics, of course, have also become the market sceptics. On the other side of the House, they have no plan for the future, only three-word slogans. A policy lightweight. We have no costings of any policies. They're trying to skate through to the election. And we have criticism, criticism of this government's performance. Well, let's just see. Let's do a comparison of how this Treasurer, this Treasurer has delivered in terms of Australia, the Australian economy. Have a look at this. Federal Labor, 5.1 per cent. Under Howard, 6.4. That was the monthly average. That sounds better. Inflation, 2.5 per cent under us, 2.6 under them. That sounds better. Home loan mortgage rate, 6.4 compared with 7.3. That sounds better. Household savings, 8.9 per cent compared with 2.3. That sounds better. 
Taxes as a percentage of GDP, 22 per cent, rather than 23.4 per cent. It reached a it reached a high of 24.2 under those opposite. That sounds better as well. Government spending, average annual growth under us, 2.9, under them, 3.3. Larger government spending under the Howard government. The investment pipeline, it's 560 billion on, uh, under us, was 213 when we took office. That sounds better as well. On infrastructure in my portfolio, we were ranked as a nation 20th out of 25 OECD countries when I got sworn in as the minister. Now we're second, second yeah. in the world, creating that future productivity growth. And those opposite aren't quite sure whether infrastructure Australia is a good idea or whether they should claim it and say they're going to create it. A farcical situation. And why we shouldn't suspend standing orders? Why do I raise those figures, Speaker? Because they're trying to knock off their own MPI, which, if they had it just sat there, is from the shadow treasurer the adverse impact of the government's economic policies on confidence. No wonder they don't want to debate about economic policy. Here they come in, here they come in, move a suspension rather than have an MPI debate on economic policy, because we know that they've got absolutely nothing to say. And what we saw from them today, Speaker, what we saw from them bizarrely on the day that Barack Obama makes a historic speech about tackling climate change and just after China has, has uh, started an ETS that's bigger than ours, on that context, the second last day, you can imagine the tactics committee this morning. I know, we haven't had a crack about climate change for a while. Let's have a go. Well, let's have a look at what the figures are. Because you know, the markets were going to collapse. Well, the stock market's up 17.5 per cent. The value of shares on the ASX is up 200 billion. The official cash rate's down 0.75. Employment is up 164,000. House prices are up 1.7 per cent, and the value of housing stock is up 68 billion. I mean, success after success. But what they tried to do today was have it both ways. They tried to move again a disruptive suspension of standing orders, but we tried to have polite Tony, polite Tony, and not and not not quite as polite Chris. Because Chris doesn't do polite. <laughs> and they're trying to wipe from history the actions of the suspensions of standing orders, the fact that this bloke, brutal Tony, went outside to that disgraceful demonstration with those signs about the Prime Minister and was prepared to stand out there, stand out there and demand, demand an immediate election. Demand an immediate election. And that is what we have seen for three years from those opposite. Three years. They said this parliament wouldn't work. They're still saying that now, even though demonstrably it has, and it has a proud legislative record over the last three years. But now, instead of standing in front of those signs that none of them noticed, instead of aggro Tony, in here, we're trying to see in the lead up to the election to him, him go into a very small ball, a very small target, and sneak through, sneak through without any policies, without any focus. Well, I tell you what, during this coming election campaign, this leader of the opposition will have to put forward his policies. He'll have to find them on education, on health on uh, aged care, on infrastructure, on the environment, he'll have to find them. It's not good enough to say no, 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 no for all of the weeks of an election campaign. He will have to actually stand up and put forward his alternative vision. And we're happy to Members take on that debate today, tomorrow, expired. next week, next month, right up to September. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All of those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is, the motion to suspend standing orders be agreed to. The ayes will pass the right of the chairs, the noes to the left. I appoint the members for Barker and Parks, tell us for the ayes, and the members for Morton and McEwen, tell us for the noes. And on in complete indulgence, welcome my mum to the chamber.
The result of the division is ayes 73, noes 74. The question is therefore negated. The Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thank you very much. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Could people quickly and quietly leave the chamber? The member for Morton has indicated he would like yeah. to make he would like Stand to receive me. the call. The member for Morton has the call. Seriously. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker. I seek leave to uh, correct the record. Uh, I've, I've been misrepresented. Does the member for Morton claim to be misrepresented? Surely not. Most grievously the member for Morton and may maliciously. Make a personal explanation. Oh, oh, and with malice of forethought, Speaker. Oh, no. uh, to, to, today, the parliamentary netball side played the press gallery, yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, I'm not sure what the collective noun is for journalists. Well, a coven, a gaggle, a murder, or whatever, the but a number of journalists James Masola, Jacqueline Maley, Liza Borello, Lauren Giannalo, Leah Craven, Briony Speed, and many others have incorrectly tweeted that they won the netball no. game. No. But no. as my colleague would correctly attest, we won the game three points to two. Thank the member for Morton for correcting the record. Is the member for Kennedy seeking the call? The member for Kennedy has the call. I move that so much of the standing and sessional orders be suspended, as would prevent members' business notice number one, given for Wednesday, 26 June 2013, Renewable Fuel Bill 2013, standing in the name of the member for Kennedy, being called on immediately and being given precedence over all other business until all stages of the bill have been concluded. I so move, Madam Speaker. The member for Kennedy has the call if he would like to speak to the motion. Um, uh, Madam, Madam Speaker, I'm being uh, what member, member of the Kennedy opposition has, has said, is everyone going to support it? Um, I, I suspect that, yes, we will not get any support in this chamber, Madam Speaker. I held up a map yesterday of the world, and all of the countries in the world outside of Africa were in colour, meaning they were on biofuels. Ethanol, Madam Speaker, the only country on earth that was in grey, outside of the oil producing countries, of course, the only country that was in grey as not having ethanol was Australia, Madam Acting Speaker. And the person over is laughing because he thinks it's funny. Well, the AMA said that 14, 1,400 people died in Sydney last year. Uh, this is the report that we read. 1,400 people died last year as a result of motor vehicle emissions. The head of the AMA for Australia has said more people die from motor vehicle emissions than motor vehicle accidents, and the member for Western Australia here thinks it's funny. He thinks that's funny. Well, well it's, the most extraordinary, it's the most extraordinary comment. He, he order, thinks it's funny just, that order, people. Order, order, just one moment. Those members that are out of their place in the chamber and having conversations, would they either move back to their place in, in the chamber or leave the chamber quietly and in an orderly fashion? I'll give now the call back to the member for Kennedy. Hey, Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, for people that can't do any homework, they've never done any research, but are very good on personal invective, that's their characteristics, their laugh. You know, that's that's their intellectual contribution. Um, his contribution is laugh. So we, we say that more people are dying of motor vehicle emissions than motor vehicle accidents, and the government continues to do nothing about it. Mr. Iemma said that he could not go another day, the Premier of New South Wales, with having the deaths of people on his conscience that simply don't have to die. The Americans went to ethanol not to help their farmers, not to cut themselves off from the 230,000 million that are going to the Middle Eastern oil producers. They did it because of the health results that came out of California, Mr Deputy Speaker, which indicated that maybe tens of thousands of people were dying as a result of motor vehicle emissions. And so the American government moved 
the Air Quality Control Act. And when you go under a certain ozone retention level, it's a funny word, um, when you go to a certain level of pollution, then it triggers the Air Quality Control Act. And that was how ethanol was introduced in the United States. According to newspaper reports, Mr. Acting Speaker, which I have to verify shortly, um, America seems to be up around 12 or 15 per cent now. What we do know is the American government claims that over the next five years they will be self-sufficient in oil. They will not, like Australia, be sending 230,000 million a year to the Middle East and oil producers. That money will be going into the pockets of Americans, Mr. Acting Speaker. But we, at the present moment, are spending, sending 19.5 thousand million dollars every year to the Middle East and oil producers which we don't have to send there, Mr Deputy Speaker. So when we rise up today, we say, do you want to create 50,000 jobs in rural Australia? Do you want to take that 20,000 million which your country is losing every year and give it to Australians instead of rich potentates in Middle Eastern countries? We are asking you, do you want people to continue to die that simply don't have to die, Mr Acting Speaker? And I refer to the works of Jonathan Streeton, the eminent thoracic surgeon in, uh, in Melbourne, who has been fighting this battle all of his life, to Professor Carney, the University of New South Wales, who has been fighting this battle most of his life, and uh, for all the other heroes in the other countries that have saved millions of lives as a result of the initiative. Now, Mr <clears throat> Deputy Speaker, in addition to that, um, we have our rural industries in desperate plight. Uh, and as you would be well aware, Mr Deputy Speaker, the value to your own personal electorate with the ethanol industry. Um, there is an, an verification, of course, the lot feeders were squarely, because they said there'd be a 15 per cent rise in grain prices. Well, heaven only knows, I attended a meeting in Western Australia, and this member's electorate who was thinking this was funny and jeering at me, there's 1,063 people attended the meeting. And the Liberal the senator's contribution was to say that I know you all want to exit and it's our duty to give you an exit with dignity. Well, I asked one of the people there that night, one of the biggest uh, grain producers in Australia, I said, was that the attitude of people meet? He said there wouldn't be a single person of the 1,063 people there, not a single person that wanted to exit the industry, uh, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker. Um, they desperately want to stay on. An extra 15 per cent over the next 10 years or over the last 10 years would not see those people in the dire straits they are in now. And as you would be well aware yourself, sir, that 15 per cent on your gross for most farmers in this country would be a 100 or 200 per cent increase in their net incomes or their ability to pay the banks, Mr Acting Speaker. So it is of immense value to the grains industry in Australia. It is of immense value to the cattle industry in Australia, where they would have unlimited amounts of distiller's grain, three times more nutritious than ordinary grain, and the same calorific value, Mr Acting Speaker. In America at the time, when I went over there on an ethanol tour, the only time I've ever been out of Australia, the price was half what it was for conventional grain. So the cattle industry now has where would we be? We would, we would kiss the ground on which the government wa wa walked, Mr Deputy Speaker, if we could get hold of that super cheap, super nutritious grain that is available at the present moment, uh, 100 million tonne of it per year in the United States, or nearly 100 million tonne per year in the United States, Mr Deputy Speaker. We're, we would not be on our knees in the cattle industry if it wasn't for the stupidity, of course, of the the government and the life cattle decision, but also, even if that hadn't occurred, I still suspect we would be in a hell of a lot of trouble. And, and we would not be in that trouble if we had access to 10 or 20 million tonne of the super cheap, uh, super nutritious feed, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, and finally, the sugar industry, uh, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, we were on $270 a tonne for 11 years, up till about three or four years ago. We're on $270 a tonne, the world price. Brazil, 40 per cent of their sugar cane went into sugar, so they, for that 40 per cent, were on $270 a tonne. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, 
for the 60 per cent of their production, they were on over $400 a ton. So they could cross subsidise from their ethanol part of their sugar industry, sugar cane industry, over the sugar part of their industry, Mr. Acting Speaker. So our sugar industry, our cattle industry, our grains industry would be fixed up on the experience of what has happened in the other countries, would be fixed up if we had this. The driving imperative in the other countries is pollution. The reason that China, India, Japan have all announced now they're moving to biofuels is the issue of pollution and the issue of the deaths mainly from particulate, but also there are, I think, 15, 20 carcinogens and conventional petrol. And of course, uh, the ultimate argument is Larry Johnson, the father of ethanol in the United States. When you pour ethanol into the river, uh, sorry, when you pour petrol into the river, fish die. When you pour ethanol into the river, fish smile. It's pure alcohol, Mr. Deputy Speaker. <laughs> and I, I conclude on that note, recommend this bill to the House and say it is a disgrace that the only country on earth now that does not have ethanol is our country. Is our country. And it's a reflection upon every single person in this place that will refuse to vote for this bill. Thank you, Mr Deputy Peace Speaker. I commend the bill and the resolution to the House. Is the uh, seconder for the member's suspension notice? I call the member for Denison. Uh, Deputy Speaker, it's my pleasure to second the motion for the member for Kennedy. Um, and I will speak ever so briefly, if you don't mind, Deputy Speaker. Um, I think these matters should be debated in this place, and it is unfortunate that the member for Kennedy has got so little traction uh, in this parliament with the issue of uh, the mandatory inclusion of ethanol in fuel for road transport. Um, it escapes me why in Australia this issue has been so hard and why we haven't made more progress by now. I mean, it is self-evident that if we had mandatory ethanol content in fuel for road vehicles, uh, that would help our farmers. Uh, it would give them an opportunity to produce other crops. It would give them an opportunity to process what would otherwise be waste and possibly burned. Uh, so it would help our farmers, including in my home state of Tasmania. Um, also, it would, I think, re well, it would for sure reduce the cost of fuel for consumers. Yes, yes, uh, absolutely. In, in countries where there is a substantial ethanol content, they, as a general rule, have a much lower cost uh, for fuel because it simply ch costs a lot less to produce the stuff. Uh, with the right government settings, it would be a tangible way for this or future government to uh, try and uh, keep a lid on the escalating cost of living for consumers. Um, it's also an obvious step towards more sustainable transport in the future. We have only so much oil in, uh, on the planet, and eventually it will, uh, it will run out or at least for many people become unaffordable. Yes, so yeah, yeah. yes, we can have electric vehicles, yes, we can do all sorts of things, but in the mix, in my opinion, it should be a move towards a sustainable fuel, uh, a more sustainable fuel, and that, of course, is ethanol. And of course, it would help clean up the environment. And the member for Kennedy has spoken about uh, some of the health advantages. When you burn ethanol, you have less particulates and other pollutants. Um, you will get better health outcomes in a place where there is a heavier, where there is a heavy reliance on ethanol fuel. Now, I do want to sound uh, a warning, however, uh, in some countries where ethanol is used in fuel widely. It has resulted in prime agricultural land, which in my opinion should be used for the production of food. Um, so we don't want our, in my opinion, I hope the member for Kennedy doesn't mind me saying this, uh, we don't want to use up our prime agricultural land to produce fuel for cars. We want to produce food for people, quality food for people, both in our own country and overseas, including for people who would otherwise be starving. Uh, and I don't agree very, very strongly in the as the strongest possible terms with the practice in some countries overseas where virgin forest, including uh, jungle, is cleared to grow um, uh, uh, grains or uh, other, other plants to produce this ethanol fuel. So I sound a warning. It shouldn't, palm oil. Palm oil. it shouldn't be at the expense of our prime agricultural land. It shouldn't be at the expense of our virgin forest and jungle. Um, but if done carefully, and in Australia we can do it carefully, I mean, it would be insane for us to be importing ethanol from countries where they have poor practices when we can produce the fuel in Australia with high-quality practices 
so we know that our workers are being looked after, our workers are getting a decent wage, our farmers are earning a decent income, and we're doing it in a way that is environmentally responsible. So, Deputy Speaker, um, I'm delighted to back up the member for Kennedy on this one. Um, I think we should suspend standing orders. There is an urgent need to do that. That's why we should do it in this parliament. We've only got a day and a bit left to go. There are a few other distractions on at the moment, but this, this is important. This is the business of running a country and making for a better country. So I support the member for Kennedy's motion, and I hope the parliament will do, uh, do likewise. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Is the motion, sorry, the question is the motion be agreed to call the Leader of Government of Business in the House? I, I thank uh, the Deputy Speaker in the House. Um, the government won't be supporting uh, this suspension at this time. I do want to record, though, uh, my respect for the fact that the member for Kennedy has been a consistent advocate uh, on this issue, has made uh, almost relentless uh, re representations uh, on, uh, on this issue and uh, is uh, a, a genuine advocate um, of uh, this issue, in part uh, because of uh, the potential economic benefits uh, for uh, industry in his electorate, but in part also due to a wider view of the impact uh, that it would have. Uh, however, I say with respect to the member for Kennedy, uh, having been a long-term advocate, he only introduced the bill on Monday. Uh, the government uh, is in a position whereby uh, the MPI has been lodged. Who knows? No. So the Leader of Government of Business in, his house, in the House. The member for Kennedy on a point of order? And it, no, well, there's the forms of the House I've, to do that, but that is not now I, to be represented. I, I've introduced it four times. Yeah, the member for Kennedy <laughs> resume his seat, the Leader of Government Business in the House. The, the member for Kennedy uh, does make a good point, even though it was quite disorderly, and I congratulate him on being able to sneak uh, that in on the record. Um, <laughs> in terms of uh, the parliament, though, uh, this particular time was only introduced this week. Uh, we do have a schedule this afternoon whereby the MPI has already been delayed by an opportunistic attempted suspension, uh, number 81 or 82, from the Leader of the Opposition. Who knows? The Shadow Treasurer is looking pretty keen there. He might come up with a policy. He might come up with a policy. So we wouldn't want to delay the opportunity for the opposition to come up with an economic policy, this is the moment. and therefore um, we uh, don't want to delay up? the member for North Sydney. Uh, we also, uh, of course, uh, have uh, a uh, valedictory of the member for New England, uh, and uh, we also have the 457 legislation, which is in its final stages. It does need uh, to pass. Uh, the, uh, the House. And I'm sure the member for Kennedy would not want to be in this chamber after 8 o'clock this evening, because there is an event that the member for Kennedy has a keen interest in, and therefore we need to get uh, business done uh, before then. And I call upon the House to oppose this uh, particular suspension uh, from uh, the member for Kennedy. The question is, the motion be agreed to all those who have that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. no. I think the noes have it. Division required? Yes. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. The ayes will pass to the right of the hair, chair and the nays to the left. <coughs> Just advising.
Lock the doors. As there are fewer than five members on the side for the ayes in this division, I declare the question negated in accordance with Standing Order 127. The names of those members who are in the minority will be recorded in the votes and proceedings. You want to do the reorder? Right up. Yeah, yeah, it'll be for me. Yeah. I present the following order to the General's Performance Order Reports for 2012-13. Number 54, Administration of Government Advertising Arrangements, August 2011 to March 2013. Number 55, Indigenous Employment, the Australian Government's contribution to the Australian Employment Covenant, Department of Education, Employment and Workplace Relations. And I call the Leader of Government Business in the House. Parliamentary papers. Put the question as moved by the Leader of Government Business in the House. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Leader of Government Business in the House. Documents are tabled in accordance with the list. So, okay, to honourable members earlier today, I move the House take note of all documents. Full details of the documents will be recorded in the votes and proceedings to answer. I call the member for Cowper. I move the debate be adjourned. I put the question the debate be adjourned. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, Leader of Government Business in the House. The Leader of Absence be given every member of the House of Representatives for the determination of the sitting of the House on Thursday, 27 June 2013, to the date of its next sitting. Put the question as moved by the Leader of Government Business in the House. All those who have that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Well, order. The Leader of Government Business has a call. Perhaps for the benefit of uh, members, uh, we will have the first two speakers from uh, each side on the MPI. Uh, then adjourn it so that uh, the member for New England uh, will then do his valedictory at a certain time, which is we have tried to accommodate people so they can have their across the chambers, it must be said, so they can accommodate their family and, uh, and friends in the gallery. I thank the House for their cooperation on this, and I must say that in terms of the valedictories, I think everyone has uh, had the opportunity to. Uh, give uh, their valedictories at the, uh, at the appropriate times for retiring members. 
and I think the fact that the member for Hume was able to come back was indeed uh, very positive indeed. I received the letter from the